I want to take all those old recycled stereotypes and I want to flip the switch. I want to take all those things that you know about a zombie game and I want to do them differently or I want to just change them completely. Hey everybody, Rob from kickstartedgames.com here and I have got Shelby. Uh, Shelby is with Dead Lemon Games and uh, they are launching a game called Lonely Undead on Kickstarter and we're really excited to have Shelby here to tell us about it, the game. Uh, Shelby, why don't you take a couple of seconds to introduce yourself? Yeah, no worries. Absolutely, Rob. Thanks so much for having me and I'm stoked to be on here today with you. Uh, my name is Shelby Matusik, and um, like Rob had said, I am with uh, Dead Lemon Games. Uh, I am a brand new to the world of game design um, as far as going the full full mile, as far as like going all the way in publishing and self-publishing. I formed Dead Lemon Games uh, mid last year around August. And uh, now, yeah, I'm on, the, I'm on the eve almost in a lot of ways, a couple more weeks to launch my very first uh, Kickstarted board game. So a lot going on right now. That's awesome, Shelby. So tell me a little bit about Lonely Undead. I've read your, your kind of uh, marketing kit that you sent out with it. You, you call it a versatile board game that is um, the role of a recently infected zombie who's out to make friends by biting and infecting the locals. So tell us a little bit about that. And are you like a zombie fan, uh, a zombie movie fan, or how did you get into this? Yeah, um, I, to, 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 to kind of answer the, the last part and then lead into the, the first part, zombie fan. I, I, I am a, a fan of, of, of zombie themed things. I like zombie movies. I would not put myself in the category of some of the other people that are like really big on zombie themed things because there are, there are people that like everything zombies. Anything that's a zombie thing, they're all about it. And I'm honestly, I'm honestly not exactly like that. I mean, I, I'm kind of like, ambivalent about about the genre which is, kind of sounds ironic because i'm making a zombie game but um but i'm not a, a super hardcore zombie fan and uh so yeah leading into to, to lonely undead and, and maybe why why it's a zombie game and why you know i feel so passionate about it you know being a zombie game because it could be themed about something else uh yeah so the game itself as you said it's 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 about uh being a zombie and about um engaging with uh, locals, moving around the board and biting and infecting the locals. And I really wanted to take the zombie theme and do something completely different. And it's one of the reasons why I stuck with the theme instead of changing the theme. Cause of course, early in my development, talking to other designers and uh, other creators, I did get some pushback about what the zombie theme is and and essentially about how a lot of people feel like it's kind of recycled and, and actually with the zombie theme, because I want to do something completely different with the zombie theme. I want to take all those old recycled stereotypes and I want to flip the switch. I want to take all those things that you know about a zombie game and I want to do them differently or I want to just change them completely. So with the game, instead of the normal perspective of, of humans that have weapons and bats and guns and are blasting through waves of zombies and bashing and brains, instead you're playing from the perspective of a, of a zombie. Uh, and your goal is not to, to kill people or to, to eat brains necessarily, which a lot of people think that's what you're doing when you're playing the zombie. But it's actually about making friends, which why well, I put that in quotations because as a confused, lonely zombie, um, the only way you know how to make friends is to bite the locals and therefore infect and convert them also into zombie friends. That's a neat take, uh, yeah. Shelby. I like that. So I thought that I'd try to bring like some new fun. life into the genre. <laughs> so when I'm, I'm reading your uh, page here, it says that you've got grid movement, um, hand management. So there's cards in this game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the cards are mostly supplies. They're, they're, they're supplies that you, you basically gather and go looking for. You can draw from a stack of them and they give you certain abilities, skills, and items that'll help you accomplish your goals. Um, I, when I decided to, to, to use this pile of, of the, the aid and, and those skills and abilities, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing weapons. Of course, zombies, they're sentient a little bit, but, but like they're not going around and trying to gather weapons. So 
there's no major items or weapons that you're acquiring. There's more like sort of things you use to scare people or maybe you can like use something you find to cause a, a special event to, to take place. And uh, yeah, so you're you're like basically managing a hand and those, those cards also can have effects on other players and the competitive certain take that uh, mechanics and tactics. Um, and if you're playing cooperatively, a lot of those cards you can use to help out the other players on your team. You can use cards to help other people like maybe get stronger or add uh, effectiveness to their bites as well. I'm looking at the board right now. I'm showing it here. I don't know if you can see, but um, so tell me a little bit across the bottom. We've got characters. I guess these are the, the main characters in the game. Is that can you the player tiles? Tell me a little bit about them and and who they are and these characters and what they do. Yeah, absolutely. So there are six characters in the game. Uh, you can play up to four players comfortably in the game. And uh, they, they have their own like specific set of attributes and also asymmetrical powers. So they each have special abilities. So um, they sort of have all the same attributes to the, like the left of the card. Um, and those are a little bit different for a character. Some may be a little bit faster or a little bit stronger than others for the different classes. And then uh, their asymmetrical powers give them different abilities sort of based off thematically their background and their involvement in the town. And uh, yes, so we have Bertha, Brittany, Ben, Billy, and Beth and Bob. And I'm glad that you asked about them because um, I haven't had an opportunity to, to, I get a lot of people will be like, why are all the names start with B? And I, I can tell you now it's because they're biters. Like at the beginning, I was trying to be clever and I was like, they're biters. So let's make all the names start with B. Um, so that's why they all have B names. Nice. Which one of these is your favorite character? And then also these, uh, the folks here on the art, are those represented by people in real life? Or do you have any uh, that you've drawn from, from uh, some of your friends or people that have helped with this game? Yeah, so my, my it kind of depends on if I'm playing like cooperatively competitive or, or, or solo. Of course, I've ran through so many play tests and so many plays of the game. Um, if I'm playing solo, I really like Billy because of his abilities. He has a special ability that helps him mitigate dice rolls. And so there are dice rolls that can affect your combat and your test with the other, uh, other living. So I like Billy for that. Um, but I think overall, uh, Ben might be my favorite character. He's like middle of the ground on his attributes, but he, he can hold more cards in his hand. He has the ability to hold more items and more cards. And so that can be pretty helpful as well. He's probably the most well-rounded character. Um, that being said, moving into like what they're based off of, uh, doing the artwork for the project, uh, what I did is, is, is I, I would look up, you know, a bunch of different, um, uh, get ideas and pull up a bunch of images of sort of these different, you know, characters that I had in my mind for something, you know, different, uh, different like classes and different sort of after I broke down what I wanted for, for uh, the character classes, I started to think about like people in occupations in the town. So I started to pull up images of those occupations and then just started to sketch up basically from there, working off those images until I came to something that was kind of decent that I liked. And then I just manipulated it on from there. So they're not, none of them are based, like none of them are actual people out there in the world. None of them are, are based off of friends. Um, but uh, there is a, a little Kickstarter secret that uh, I'm trying to, to actually have a few people that are living characters in the game of a special reward tier that will be based completely off of a uh, special backer, special backer tier. Awesome. So when I look at this character, I must assume that Bob uh, lives in the mayor's mansion. Is that where he comes from? <laughs> no, he's uh, Bob's a retired trucker. Like he loves being in the road. He's just, he's a tank class. He likes throwing his weight around. He's slow, but, um, but he's strong. Well, tell me a little bit about this board. So I see the town here. I've got it showing. We've got the mayor's mansion. We've got the bakery, the school. Tell me about the little places in this town and, and what are their significance? Yeah, so this side of the board, um, the board's actually double-sided. You can see on the upper right-hand uh, corner of your image there, there are some uh, tiles. Those are polyomino uh, double-sided tiles that represent all those locations that you see printed on this side of the board. So there's a printed side of the board that's like a base game where you can just throw it out and hop right in, uh, smoother setup, a little bit quicker and uh, easier to sort of play in and 
uh, easier to sort of like move through gameplay. And the locations that you see there, um, they have different entrances and they also have different effects that correspond with the living. All the living that you're in encountering all have very uh, distinctive and unique uh, characters. They all have their own specific set of attributes and they also have locational bonuses. Say for example, you encounter, um, you sneak up on somebody in the school and you reveal the living card to see who it is and it happens to be the teacher. The teacher actually gets a strength and a, uh, an alertness bonus when she's in the school. So there are like different interactions based off of where you're moving around in the map and also where you might encounter specific living in the map as well. Um, and then with the, with the other side, the blank side with the tiles, each location, not all of them, but most of the locations have a locational bonus um, that adds another, uh, another uh, piece of like strategy, another layer of depth. Like for example, if you play the mutated mode with the blank side and you place the tiles, the bar, for example, you automatically win your stealth checks in the bar because thematically it's loud, um, which you don't have that on the base side, the printed side of the board. All right. Well, I've scrolled to a different picture here and I want to, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the components that you um, are wanting to put with the game? And I see there's dice, uh, a couple of different types of dice. It looks like you've got some uh, cardboard standees here, or maybe there's something uh other material, but uh, could you tell us a little bit about the components? Yeah, absolutely. So the hand is holding one of the uh, one of the character standees. So that's one of the playable characters. He's holding Ben there. Um, if you see uh, this, the sh you know, shorter standees, sort of like the shorter uh, cutouts there, um, you have, uh, yep, and you have uh, the different living um, that you'll encounter. So. The living are represented by tokens. You'll see little circular tokens there that are flat on the board. And uh, these are completely unknown to you. They just represent people that, that are there. When you encounter them, you flip over the card, you reveal who they are. And uh, if you uh, are interacting with this particular living and you move away from them to go do something else, then that's when you place the standee out on top of the piece to help show that that's who that is, to help organize the board and, and help, uh, help make it clear that that's that's who that is after you reveal them. So those are the living standees. Um, and you can also see sort of on the one on the, the farthest to the right is a little purple shape up on top of its head. And that is a individual that has been bitten and the bite was unsuccessful. point. You take your personal bite marker, which is the color of your character. And you place it directly on top of it to show that you have bitten it and that you failed. And that means that another person could swing on in there and then they can try to make a bite on it as well at that time. All right, that's uh, that's cool. Thanks for that explanation, Shelby. So um, let's see what else we got here. So I, this one's a little more top view. Uh, this is, um, yeah, so you've kind of gone through that. Talk about, what is this tile, KL? So there's three different classes of the living. There are uh, kids, generic, and officers. And uh, they are essentially uh, a gradient of difficulty for interacting with them. So the officers are a lot stronger and they're harder to, to make your friends. However, there are rewards for infecting specific people and the rewards for, um, for infecting the officers and making them your friends uh, are a lot greater than say a generic or a kid living individual. And so there's different, uh, different tokens on the board to sort of show the different kinds of, of, of living that you could possibly encounter. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the art. So um, you, you did this art yourself? I did, yeah. I, um, I did pretty much all of the art by myself. The only art uh, that I didn't do and any design that I didn't do was uh, the, the buildings. So those locational building tiles that you see the art within those buildings, within those locations, um, was done third party by, by a, a Canadian artist um, uh, and who helped me out with that. So everything else I did myself. Okay, awesome. And now tell me a little bit about the play testing. How has that gone? How much play testing have you done with the game? And uh, what, what's that experience been like for you? The, the play testing, uh, of course, you know, when I started developing the game and getting into play testing it was really difficult because it was in the height of the pandemic. Um, 
luckily I was designing a game that wasn't was wasn't so hard for me to play multi-handed, multi-character, or even solo to sort of uncover and do a lot of the development. I'm also very lucky that I have a couple of uh, close fans, friends that um, were uh, willing to meet with me on a weekly basis and sort of do at least some additional tests, you know, with other people. And then I did have some controlled groups of uh, some 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 safe pandemic safe. Uh, playtesting events at local places as well, where everyone's all masked up, and I and, and did some of that late last year. And uh, since then, I've had a, a handful of other playtests with bigger groups and, and, and a couple of interesting um, playtests and demonstrations for doing uh, team building exercises with a couple of local organizations. Those have been fun as well. Easily, easily over 100 hours in playtesting for sure. Probably not 100 plays necessarily of individual games, but also there's a digital version that I built up that is on uh, TTS, so Tabletop Simulator via Steam. It has a full digital version, and I was able to utilize that, of course, during uh, that time frame and do a lot of digital testing as well. How has that been? So um, Tabletop Simulator is something that we've seen has been very successful at helping people get an idea of what the game they're going to get in hand. And, um, you know, we've seen creators really respond well to that, just, you know, despite the pandemic, um, you know, for certain types of games, uh, depending on the mechanics, it can really um, represent well, you know, how the actual gameplay experience is going to be and uh, get a lot of, you know, relevant uh, feedback and get kind of some traction on the game. So is the Tabletop Simulator link live and um, or is that going to be dependent upon the Kickstarter? Or how's that? How's that looking right now? Yeah, it's 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 live. I mean, anybody could search and and find it. I haven't done a, a large amount of promo surrounding the Tabletop Simulator link. I just haven't had the like sort of the resources, the time, and the priority to sort of focus on really pushing the Tabletop Simulator uh, version of the game. I've utilized it for play testing. I've thrown it out there um, in the channels. I've talked about it plenty of time, but I haven't been focusing on it as far as my marketing is concerned. I love the idea of TTS, of Tabletop Simulator. I love the idea of people being able to hop in and try the game. I've also used it very effectively as a teaching tool for working with other creators or other people that are interested in, um, in promoting the game or working with the game. So that has been very helpful on that aspect. Really easy to just hop in you know, online, get a voice channel going, uh, uh, you know, something like this going and run through a couple turns and teach the game to these people um, that are all over the world. So that's that's been very helpful. I think that's probably the most, besides the fact that you can like hop in and try a game out before you buy it. I think the ability to teach people and access, you know, play with people all over the planet, show them this this thing in a digital form is is invaluable compared to what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. Right. So uh, in coming up with Lonely Undead, were there any games that you really drew some inspiration from? Are there games that you've grown up playing that you really said, I really want to incorporate, incorporate this mechanism or, or did it all just come from, from that awesome stash of yours? <laughs> I wish, I wish, I do feel sometimes that the stash holds power, but if it did hold power, I wish it would give me more, you know? I could really use a lot of help sometimes, <laughs> but um yeah, so the, a lot of the mechanisms did obviously draw from a lot of games I really enjoyed. I, I will say that I was a big Munchkin fan. I think some of the like the way to utilize card systems and the way to utilize a, equipment through the card, uh, through a deck of cards, is, is, is something that I definitely drew inspiration from Munchkin from, you know, having items and abilities and things like that that you can cycle really in and out of, easily out of a card deck. Um, definitely influenced me. Uh, I definitely, like, I'm trying to think of some other games I played growing up that really kind of led me towards being uh, really into some of these these other mechanics. I think maybe, I don't know, people do tell me, and I think I did draw some inspiration from Clue that I didn't fully really realize. Maybe subliminally I kind of drew some inspiration from playing Clue when I was younger, but people see like the rooms and the locations and the bonuses and moving in and out, sort of the secret things you do they kind of think about Clue. So I think maybe I just- Let's hope you sell as many Clue copies as, well. as Clue. That'll be a great, that'll be great. Oh my God, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, check back in with me in about 15 years, yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about Kickstarter as a mechanism for launching your game. What made you decide on crowdfunding and what are your aspirations for your campaign? And kind of, uh, you know, um, one other thing I'd like to ask is, do you have any plans for, you know, some campaigns have lots of 
stretch goals and different things like that. And some people just say, Hey, here's my game and I want to fund it. And here's, you know, so what is the strategy of your campaign and, and kind of uh, the choice of Kickstarter and how, how you're going to do with that? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this whole thing of me like starting this game company and trying to publish this game, I mean, uh, it all kind of spawned out of the pandemic. I was trying to focus on creative outlets and do things to sort of occupy myself. I was displaced and out of work because of the pandemic. And, and I started to focus on the idea for this game. And it got to the point where I was encouraged and I felt like I could try to do something with it. And with the game, with was trying to get a board game out in the world, you can self-publish or you can pitch it to publishers. And I wanted to pitch it to publishers because I didn't want to do all the stuff that came with self-publishing. But after time and a lot of encouragement uh, from a good friend of mine, I ended up deciding I could probably go the self-publishing route, which is where you have to basically form a company around it. And at that point, you basically got to have enough money and enough investors to you know, do a print run uh, outright. But at the same time, you also need to have a fan base and an amount of people out there in the world that you know, are willing to buy the game. And that's where Kickstarter comes in. Uh, uh, Kickstarter makes it so you can get help funding your project, but at the same time, it works a lot as a platform to build hype and build an audience and build a fan base even before you have the thing manufactured. So when you do manufacture the game, you have all these people that see new development, who have been a part of the process, who have influenced you and encouraged you and supported you along the way. And now, now they're there and ready to buy the game when it's manufactured. And I think that's a beautiful part of the model. Uh, so going forward with that, uh, you know, doing the best I can and trying to get funded to to hit that 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 uh, minimum order quantity to get that print run done and get it out in people's hands. Uh, that being said, you know, I I stretch goals. I, I would love. I built the the game with all these high ambitions for expansion and doing more with it. Um, it's, it's it's it lends itself very easily to adding maybe more missions for co-op and scenario style play, even sort of like more hybrid to tabletop RPG style sort of play. I was definitely encouraged and influenced by um, getting into some of those table style, tabletop RPGs and a little bit of D&D. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a hybrid of a lot of different things and it has the ability to basically be a little bit more like a tabletop RPG in some simple, you know, very simple ways. And um, so, yeah, with the stretch goals, I'm looking forward to try to push out some of that content I'd like to, to, to get out there in the world, such as, you know, maybe a little starter pack of scenarios that you could play with co-op mode or even like a small little starter, like campaign, mini campaign for a solo mode where you can kind of work through different characters and have different objectives as, as you move through the game. So, so that's one, thing, of one thing I did uh, note is you say that it is one to four players. So you've already got the ability to play in a solo mode. Yes, absolutely. And that was from the get go with my design. I wanted to these days with games, you know, usually you have this this push for especially Kickstarter games, people like, oh, is there a solo mode? And so they'll try to develop or kind of like, you know, maybe even sort of half wash out a solo mode just to please those people. But since I was since I'm new and fresh to this and I have a fresh base and I had all that knowledge up front, I wanted to start from the, the very beginning with the design to say, you have a solo mode and I wanted to sort of make it a dedicated solo mode and not some sort of like thing that I added later and sort of half washed into it. I wanted to design the whole game around the ability to play solo, competitive and co-op from the get go. Awesome. Well, Shelby, so uh, what we got about a week and a half, two weeks before you plan to launch this campaign. Not sure when we'll air this video, but um, there'll be a link below in the description here um for the kickstarter and uh also your website looks like you've got a, a couple of places where folks can uh, check out your game why don't you tell us a little bit about where they can find out more information about both uh lonely undead and your brand um dead lemon games yeah absolutely so the website uh deadlemongames.com a lot of information up there things about the you know the company the startup sort of like some information about me and, and where how all that spawned uh, and then, of course, a lot of information about the game and how to get more involved. Facebook, very active on Facebook, Facebook group for the game. So Dead Lemon Game, uh, Dead Lemon Games has its business page, but then also Lonely Undead has a, a group uh, just specifically for the game. So there's that as well. There's a lot of uh, fun little updates and, and involvement and, and a little community built on that, which is a lot of fun. 
We're on Instagram as well, just under Dead Lemon Games for the Instagram. And then, of course, we have the pre-launches up for Kickstarter. So, I mean, all avenues are open. Excellent. Has there, is there anything that you wanted to cover uh, in this interview that we haven't gotten to so far? Any, any points that you wanted to make? Um, I, I don't think so. I think, I think you've done a fantastic job, Rob, facilitating uh, sort of the main things that, that I want to get out there and, and, and tell people about the game. Uh, and the main thing I want to tell people about the game is that this isn't, this isn't another zombie game. That's something that I pushed really heavily, heavily about the game because I want people that when they hear the word zombie game, when they see the title of a zombie game, they get those recycled stereotypes we talked about earlier. And the main thing I'm trying to tell people and trying to show people um, is that it's not. It's completely unlike any other zombie game you've ever played. And, uh, and I think that's something that's special. It's something I'm really trying to do with the genre. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the main thing I really want to get across to people with this. Besides that, you know, if that interests you and you're still in checking it out and supporting a small first time indie, uh, indie uh, publisher, please, uh, please come check us out. June 7th is the launch date on Kickstarter. Awesome. Shelby, before we go, I want to throw you a little curveball. Tell me something that you might have learned about yourself during the process of creating a game from start to finish. Can you give us any insight on what that journey has been like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, a little, a little bit of a confession with the curveball. The, all the design aspects, uh, the, 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 the art and designing the game itself, I have thoroughly enjoyed, which makes a lot of sense. I'm, I, like, I, I love my creative outlets. I love building things, working with my hands. I love designing. I love drawing. I love art. Um, the other side that comes with publishing a game, and this is also a, a, a little nugget of advice for other people that are doing this, like you don't want to underestimate the business side of what comes with designing and putting a game out there in the world. And I'll be 100% honest with you, like this is a trial sort of probation you know, thing for me as well. And I, and I don't know how I feel about being a businessman when it comes to the, this part of designing and, and putting a game out there in the world. A lot of the logistics, a lot of the, the tape, the bureaucracy, all the stuff that goes with the, that side, that's not all the fun stuff that you actually see is it's a lot it's definitely a lot going on and um I, i'm not 100 percent sure if that's for me that's what i'm here to, to try to learn so we'll see as we as we keep going with this passion in this project well i tell you what you can tell you've put a lot of creativity behind it you've put a lot of thought into it the product that you're going to put up on kickstarter or kickstarter uh looks really sharp so Shelby, I think you're going to do great. I think uh, you've got the uh, the kind of metal that it takes to be successful with one of these campaigns. And so, folks, go to the uh, links below. Check out Dead Lemon Games and Lonely Undead. Back it on Kickstarter. And uh, make sure to like and subscribe and do all the things that we do uh, here on the Kickstarter Games channel. Shelby, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us. And good luck with your campaign. Absolutely. Thanks for having me so much. I appreciate that.